Welcome, uh, everyone, to our first uh, developmental disability uh, research and uh, clinical rounds for 2021. Uh, we are thrilled to have uh, as our first speaker, uh, Dr. Suzanne uh, Schmidt, who I've had the personal uh, pleasure of getting to know over the last couple of years. And uh, apart from being an incredibly nice person, Suzanne also has a remarkable CV, one that is uh, uh, very, um, that I'm envious of. So, so Suzanne is, the, uh, is a professor of department in the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry, and also the Vice Dean for Basic Medical Sciences at Schulich. Uh, she was also previously the Director of the Neuroscience Program at Western and the Associate Dean of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies at, uh, at Schulich. So as a long, uh, or as a significant track record at, um, at Western, uh, Suzanne did her PhD at the University of Tübingen in Germany, uh, and then did her postdoc at the University Eye Hospital in Tübingen as well. She later was the Heisenberg Fellow at the University of Toronto, which I want to say there was some uncertainty about, but I will not uh, say that. Well, I guess I just did. Uh, Dr. Schmidt is a basic scientist who has been working with rat models, studying auditory evoked uh, behaviors and cognitive function for more than 20 years. Her main line of research is focused on synaptic mechanisms, underlying sensory information processing and sensory filtering, filtering and its importance as a prerequisite for higher cognitive function. Uh, Suzanne has published over 75 articles in excellent journals and is currently the principal investigator for co-PI on four grants and a co-applicant on a fifth uh, and is remarkably, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, very efficient, we'll say, um, uh, and, and hardworking. So Suzanne, thank you again and welcome. Well, uh, thank you, um, uh, Rob. I will... Again, share my slides now. Oh, um, actually, Suzanne, if I could just say one thing, sorry. The, uh, so uh, we will, uh, wow, so Meg McQueen, uh, I don't know if I know Meg, but she is somehow here in five different times, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and, um, but so we're gonna record this. So if people have questions, just realize you're being recorded. The other thing is it, for me, it's a bit hard to keep track of people asking questions in the chat or in the Q and A and things. And uh, I think it's easier to use, uh, for me anyway, if people use the, uh, the raise your hands function and then we can have people actually ask questions directly instead of typing them. So if people have questions, please just raise your hand and I will address that. Okay. Let me get a laser pointer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as... Um, Rob uh, already mentioned my research program has been focusing on sensory filtering mechanisms for more than 20 years, but it's only only has been in the last, I would say, five years or so when we really became interested in how sensory filtering and sensory processing in general is, um, is different, is altered in, uh, in autism. And um, my research really also tries to um, uh, improve translation between um, the animal models that we use and uh, the situation in humans. And I will talk a little bit about this today as well. I want to start with the acknowledgements that normally often come uh, at last and then are kind of just tucked there at the end. Um, all the work that I'm going to show you um, was a, a huge team effort by a number of trainees, postdocs, graduate trainees and undergraduate trainees um, these are just the one, the, the current and very recent ones that have worked on the particular project I'm talking about today. And uh, the, especially the ones in bold, because these uh, people have actually contributed data to the talk, uh, the, what I'm going to show today. And um, I'll actually uh, mention them later on as well. And of course, all the funding agencies. I do not have, uh, I want to declare this, I do not have any uh, uh, commercial interest, any conflicts of interest. Um, these are all public uh, funding agencies that uh, funds uh, my basic research program. So uh, in terms of autism, I think I don't have to uh, probably talk a lot about what autism is in this uh, round. Um, it is a, uh, a spectrum disorder. So it's an umbrella term for a number of uh, disorders with overlapping uh, symptoms. It's a ra uh, rather common um, diagnosis. Um, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder, of course. I think we all agree that um, uh, kids from very young age, um, like relatively soon after birth can actually already uh, show signs of uh, autism. And it is, um, 
um, pretty accepted that it is both um, caused by genetic and or environmental um, causes. There are a handful of um, genes where a single um, lack of that gene or a single mutation can actually cause uh, autism. Uh, one example would be Rett's syndrome. Um, there are fragile X syndrome as well. There are other ones where it is a known um, uh, gene that has a mutation that actually causes um, the disorder. In most cases though, um, it is not that straightforward. So we, have, we know more than a hundred genes mutation um, um, that are associated, so more than 100 genes where mutations are associated with an increased risk of uh, developing autism. And uh, we also know some environmental um, causes that when there's a genetic predisposition maybe and in, 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 um, in, thereby interacting with uh, genetic causes that can cause uh, autism or where an environmental impact might uh, lead to uh, genetic disruptions. Um, so it is very complex. It's thought though that these more than 100 genes are actually converging on only a handful of um, biochemical processes that are impacted and that are crucial in brain development and thereby then causing autism. So although it's a huge number of genes, it is probably not much more than a handful of biomedical processes that can be impacted at different levels through all these genes that then impact brain development. And I will get back to that a little bit later in the talk. Um, autism is a very um, human, Disorder, it is diagnosed by the DSM-5, and uh, we know uh, the DSM-5 lists two core uh, groups of symptoms. One are the, um, uh, the social interaction and communication uh, group symptoms, um, where, they, where uh, uh, individuals with autism or autistic individuals show uh, persistent deficits. And the other group of symptoms are the restricted and rep repetitive behavior uh, patterns, but also stereotyped uh, um, motor movements, insistence of sameness, uh, inflexibility, adherence to routines, and hyper, hypo or hyper reactivity to sensory input, unusual interest in sensory aspects, and so on. So the sensory uh, types of um, um, symptoms seemed uh, or were first acknowledged uh, in the DSM-5, and they are part of these core symptoms. And so the point I want to make here today is that these sensory symptoms actually are a huge opportunity to actually study mechanisms that uh, take place in the brain that lead to autism and to also study potential um, treatments for at least this group of symptoms, uh, the sensory symptoms in autism. So as I, as I said, this, this, the, core, uh, the sensory uh, symptoms are a, a core symptom of uh, uh, autism with the DSM-5. Um, what is interesting is that these sensory symptoms often predict the severity of other uh, symptoms. So this means that they're probably um, caused by the same underlying molecular mechanism caused, for instance, by a mutation or a number of mutations. Um, so if we uh, figure out what, how, this, uh, how sensory systems are impacted, we can probably learn something about how the brain in general or generally is impacted um, in autism. But there's also a debate to what extent the sensory symptoms are actually causing other symptoms as well. Because if you think about um, if someone does not process sensor information the same way as other people, it might be difficult to function normally in the social context. It uh, might actually explain uh, stereotypic movements that uh, are reportedly soothing for individuals with autism. So it might actually um, um, kind of compensate for this over sensitivity or reactivity to sensory stimuli and so on. So, um, 
that is an ongoing debate. Um, you have to uh, uh, keep in mind that sensory information is the only input into the brain. So if sensory input is somehow disrupted, any input into the brain is different. And this is a challenge for a developing brain to then develop normally. So the sensory symptoms are for sure important, an important group of symptoms um, in autism. The other um, um, fact about sensory uh, processing is that sensory pathways are actually pretty well described. Um, they are relatively easy, accessible, and they are highly conserved. So the auditory or the tactile or the visual pathway in humans look very much like uh, the pathways in other mammals. And so we can, there is a higher translatability from sensory path uh, within sensory pathways between animals and humans than, for instance, if we study social behavior or language or some higher cognitive functioning, because that, uh, these um, uh, processes are A, not very well understood in terms of neural circuits and synaptic mechanism, but they are also very complex and might actually not be very well reflected in uh, animal models or might actually be non-existent like um, uh, language, for instance. So um, we think that uh, studying sensory pathways in autism actually provide a great opportunity to study disease mechanisms and even to test therapies in an animal model because it has higher translational value than many of the other symptoms in autism, but they are actually a really important symptom. So in my lab, we focus mainly, not exclusively, but uh, ex exclusively, but mainly on aud auditory processing. So the processing of sound. Um, and the reason is because it's very easy to control. We can play sound and we, you know, if you'd study the visual system, you might have to study in the dark, but um, we can study in the normal lab and we can just play sounds or we can make the environment very quiet or very noisy and so on. And in terms of auditory processing, they are really neat uh, um, electrophysiological -physio and behavioral readouts um, of both brainstem level and cortical level uh, auditory processing that we can measure in humans as well as in uh, mammals. And the mammals we work with mostly is uh, rats. And so I want to just quickly show you, this is the auditory pathway. So it starts at the hair cells and the cochlea and the ear. And then there's a first set of neurons, the spiral ganglion cells here in red that make a synapse in the cochlear nucleus. And then this pathway travels up the brain stem to the midbrain here. There's another set of synapses in the colliculus. And then there are uh, a set of synapses in the thalamus. This is all still brain stem. And from the thalamus then going to the primary audit auditory cortex and from there then to other cortices. So again, a very well described pathway. And that pathway looks exactly the same in the rat. In terms of uh, measurements, we can measure the auditory brainstem response, which is a waveform that we measure with electrodes in response to a short sound that we play. This um, auditory brainstem response or ABR has these peaks here, these waveforms, and these waveforms are known to reflect neural processing at different stages within the brainstem. So we actually have a measure of how the brainstem processes auditory information. On the other end, we have EEG or auditory, where we can measure auditory evoked potentials. And this is um, uh, measured by, again, external electrodes uh, 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 adhere to the skull, um, where we can play sounds and we can then measure very um, characteristic waveforms, both in the animals and in the human, um, to see how a sound is then processed on the cortical level. And then we have these behavioral readouts. So we can measure the acoustic starter response, which is basically a reflex in response to a sudden loud noise. But the nice thing about this starter uh, reflex is that we know the pathway um, mediating the starter uh, um, response. And that is, it's the spiral ganglion cell here that then um, innervates a second set of neurons that actually project here to this region here, the 
reticular formation. And here in this reticular formation, which is this uh, here, the PNC, we have giant neurons that directly inter, uh, innovate motor neurons and make the animal startle. So the acoustic startle response is a readout of sensory processing at the very early stage here um, in the brainstem, in the lower brainstem. We also have a phenomenon that is called prepulse inhibition of startle. Um, which is the inhibition of the startle response when um, a prepulse is given, which could be an auditory or a visual or any kind of other stimulus. And we know that this pathway that's mediated, this inhibition is mediated through a short pathway that in, uh, includes the, the midbrain. And um, so with, by measuring prepulse inhibition of startle, we get a little bit information about sound processing here in the midbrain uh, level and finally, of course, we can do all kinds of auditory perceptual tasks where we ask a rat or a human, what do you think is louder or, or um, what kind of, if we do repetitive sounds, what kind of, what repetition rate is faster and so on. And thereby gain um, uh, information about how an individual perceives sound. So that is certainly the cortical level then when we come to, per, to, um, to conscious perception of sound um, um, and ask to, uh, an ind individual to report what they actually hear. So I want to quickly show you how this all looks like. Um, so in terms of auditory brainstem response, we can measure these uh, in children or in the rat. And in both times we uh, adhere electrodes to the outside of the skull um, at, um, behind the ear at the bone there and reference electrodes, for instance, on the forehead. And we do exactly the same here with the rat. In the rat, these electrodes go a little bit under the skin so that um, the rat is normally anesthetized. Uh, the, the child is not, of course, but sometimes distracted with um, some playing something or watching a, a silent movie on, the iPad, on an iPad. And again, these um, character characteristic waveforms that we measure that look very similar in, in the human and in the rat. In the rat, it's a little bit more squish because the brain is shorter and thereby the waveforms follow uh, each other a little bit faster. Um, we also can uh, uh, measure these auditory evoke responses on the cortex using EEG. This looks like an EEG setup that might be actually a little different or challenging with a kid with autism, but we don't actually need the entire cap with all these electrodes in order to uh, measure uh, auditory evoke responses. We um, need a very limited set of electrodes um, that are over the uh, temporal area of the cortex in order to measure these evoked um, responses. So these are responses on the cortical level to sound, these P1 and 1, P2 waves that we can measure in the rat as well, very similar again. And these figures, by the way, are all from a recent paper from a PhD student co-supervised with Brian Almond. Her name, her name is Kayla Scott. Um, that she submitted um, to autism research recently. In terms of behavioral measure, so these were the electrophysiological measures. Again, very neat because we can me measure the same way in humans and in rats. And they are, uh, the same is true for these behavioral measures. So the acoustic startle response in humans, we just measure the eye blink by measuring by basically an electromyogram from the uh, muscle underneath the eye that, uh, uh, that make the eye blink in response to a, lo uh, a loud and sudden uh, sound that we uh, play. And in the same session, we can also measure, measure prepulse inhibition. So if this is a startle sound, then this would be the eye blink, the startle response. The, um, if we play a little pre-pulse, so it's, uh, another sound that does actually not elicit a startle response, nevertheless, the, uh, the eye blink in response to the startle sound now is greatly reduced. And that reduction between this and this, that is what we call prepulse inhibition. It's an automatic response. And I will talk about a little bit about what that does uh, later on. But we can do that both in the humans and the rats. And the rats, by the way, we do not measure the eye blink. We measure the entire whole body switch by putting the rat basically on a platform. and. If you look at the startle magnitude, how strong an animal or a human startles, and these are the different uh, loudnesses of the startle sound, 
we see an, a nice uh, I.O. function, and we see almost the same function in rats. So both humans and animals startle uh, when a sound becomes louder than 85 decibel. And if we play the pre-pulse, uh, pre and depending on how loud it is, this is an 85 decibel, decibel pre-pulse displayed 120 or 100 milliseconds before the startle pulse. It's a little faster here in rats because the rat has a smaller brain again, processes a little faster. Um, we get this 70% pre-pulse inhibition. That means the startle amplitude is reduced by 70% when there's a pre-pulse. And it has is nothing to do with learning. This is just an inbuilt mechanism in the brain. And then finally, lastly, is this um, what we measure, how we measure um, uh, on um, behavior, auditory evoked behavior on the cortical level. This is when we ask a human and the rat, for instance, about the uh, rate repetition rate. So we train a human or we ask a human um, when we display this three hertz repetition, which is like chick, 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 um, to report that this is slow. And when we do a fast repetition rate, 20 hertz, which is like, chick, 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 I almost can't do that. It's very fast. Mm -hmm. Then to press another button to say that this is fast. And then on the test session, after we did that uh, for a certain time, we display um, repetition rates that are in between. So they are a little ambivalent. And we look how often the human reports whether this was fast and slow. So this is the percent reported fast. When we display the three hertz, of course, they never say it's fast. They normally always say it's slow. When we present the 20 hertz, they always say it's fast. And when we uh, display the intermediate ones, um, there is an increasing tendency to um, report it as fast as the rate is faster. And of course, we. Uh, pseudo-randomize the presentation of these different uh, rates. And we can do the same with the rat. It's a little bit more complicated. We can't just tell the rats to press a, press a button. We have to train them by rewarding them when they do the right thing. So we train them to touch uh, a left lever when it's slow and the right lever when it's fast. And that takes maybe two weeks until the rat knows that and does that um, um, reliably by getting a reward every time it does it right. But once it has learned it, we do the same test as with a human and we get the same psychometric function here where it's a nice um, S-shaped curve. And the, the break point which they, where they say 50% of that is, is fast or, or, or slow. So when they report 50-50 is a little faster in red, so it's at just under 15 hertz. In human, it's at around 9 hertz. But other than that, it's a very similar behavior. So these are the tools that we use. So we have these two electrophysiological measurements and then these behavioral uh, reports to, that tells us how does the brain in humans and in an animal process sound. So now we can use these tools to see how is that different now in autism. And this has been um, done in humans, and I will show this uh, in, a, in a bit. But first of all, um, the reason why we want to do it is because then we want to use the animal to actually look at the mechanisms underlying any changes. And so um, in terms of looking at the animal, um, we need, of course, an animal that shows the same symptoms as um, people with autism do. And I will. I will show actually the autism symptoms and our rat model symptoms together. So what is our rat model? There is no autistic rat. Um, aut autism is, as I said in my introduction, an intrinsically human disorder. And the way it's diagnosed, a lot of it is only applies to human. Nevertheless, of course, a, a rat, an animal model or a rat model can model a group of symptoms. And in this case, the sensory symptoms that we see in autism. But uh, an animal model needs to uh, be better than that. In order to have a good animal model, we need construct, phase, and predictive validity. And construct validity means that whatever causes these symptoms in animals should be the same causes that cause uh, autism in humans. Phase validity means it presents with a, a similar phenotype, so similar uh, symptoms. And predictive validity means that it should respond to treatment uh, in the same way as do uh, humans. 
So as I mentioned there, an environmental and uh, genetic uh, causes for, um, for autism, uh, environmental causes are, for instance, prenatal exposure to valproic acid, which is an anti-seizure medication, uh, very effective, but has shown to increase in humans if uh, pregnant females take valproic acid during pregnancy, it increases the risk for the child to actually be autistic. Yeah. Um, we also know that um, maternal immune activation through infections, yeah. virus, virus or bacterial infections um, can increase the risk of a child to become autistic. And I both, can, hello, I hear sound. Both can be um, mimicked in the animal, of course, by injecting viproic acid into an animal model or by activating the maternal immune um, system during pregnancy through um, mimics of uh, viruses or bacteria, uh, namely poly-IC or um, lipo, uh, lipopolysaccharides, which um, are parts that we find in the cell wall of bacteria. And there are other environmental effects uh, or causes that might be a little bit more difficult to actually model in the animal model because, for instance, old age of a father that in the rat, a rat only gets two or three years old. So we really don't, can't um, model the old age. And then there are the genetic uh, causes. And I mentioned at the beginning that there are these single gene causes for syndromes with core symptoms of autism. One is the red syndrome, the fragile X syndrome, and one is the cortical dysplasia focal epilepsy symptoms. Um, and also, and there are others where we actually know the gene that is affected, and it's only one gene, MECP2 and, and RET syndrome, uh, fragile X, ment uh, fragile mental, uh, mental, mental re retardation protein and fragile X, and then the catnap2 gene in um, cortical dysplasia and focal epilepsy. So what we chose for our study is actually the last one, the catnap2 um, gene. So we, um, why catnap2? Catnap2 codes for a protein that is called Casper2. And um, mutations in Casper2 or in, cat, in the catnap2 gene um, causes a rare uh, single gene uh, syndrome, which I just mentioned, but it's um, a severe neurodevelopmental disorder with core symptoms of autism. It has been found in a population of uh, old order Amish people in Pennsylvania, where there are families with up to four uh, children that um, have these um, mutation. It's, a, it's, a, it's all the same mutation. It's a, a frame shift mutation that actually renders the Casper 2 protein not functional. So they basically have no catnap 2, functional catnap 2 gene. Catnap 2 is ex heavily expressed during development. Um, it's mostly expressed in sensor, sensory pathways and cortical areas that relate to sensory processing and to language. And it's also uh, closely related to language. It's controlled by FOXP2, which is another gene that is very important for language uh, development. And these children that have this CASPA2 or CATNAP2 mutation, they all are nonverbal. Um, they learn a little bit of language at the beginning, but they um, regress and they end up uh, being uh, nonverbal. Um, there are a lot of other mutations other than in this uh, Pennsylvanian population um, that have subsequently been uh, shown to be highly associated with a higher increased risk in autism. Not all of them are complete loss of function uh, mutations but they, um, they, are, they just um, kind of reduced the, 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 um, the, the level of, of CASPER2, or there might even be a gain of function, but um, these mutations all have been associated with a higher risk of autism. So in this round, I won't talk much about the CATNAP2 gene. Um, it is the largest gene in the human genome and it's, uh, play, it's lo located on the seventh chromosome Q35. Again, it um, codes for a protein called CASPER2, which is a cell adhesion molecule and receptor from the family of neurexins. So it is very interaction, uh, very important for interactions between different types of neurons and neurons and glia.
during the development of the brain. It in, is involved in the myelinization of axons during the development and in, in the adult as well. It localizes potassium channels in the membrane um, at the, the axon where action potentials have to occur, but also in synapses. And it is important for stabilizing synapses so the connections between neurons, especially between different cell types. And important is that this cusp 2 gene is highly uh, homologous between rodents and mammals. And what we see on the top is just all these arrows and bars. These are all mutations in the catnap 2 gene that are related to autism, intellectual disability, the cortical dysplasia, focal epilepsy syndrome, speech delay, ADHD, and so on. So most importantly, um, there have been uh, uh, mice and rats that have a catnap knockout. And both the rats and the mice show core symptoms of um, ASD, of autism, uh, in terms of social behavior, in terms of stereotypic behavior, in terms of hyper, hyper, uh, locom being hyper-locomotive, hyper uh, and so on. And I won't show this data, although uh, some of that uh, we actually published, but I will focus on auditory processing in this talk. So what does auditory processing looks like, what changes do we see in autism? And now I sh will show you data from humans and then the data in our catnap2 rats. And I will only show you very small snippets of the data. I don't want to overwhelm people here with the data. So what I show here, for instance, are the auditory brainstem waves. So um, there are a lot of studies out there that have done, not a lot, but quite some that uh, have done auditory brainstem recordings in autism. And what they uh, generally show is that auditory brainstem waves in children with autism are lower and slower. Uh, and if we look at this, so this, are, um, this is one example, uh, it's infants there between uh, zero and three months. So newborns basically left ear and right ear uh, in black, um, um, kids that children that later on were diagnosed with autism and control. And we can see that uh, they have a, later, a, a higher latency of the auditory brainstem waves than um, uh, the controls. And if we look later in the um, development with 1.5 to 3.5 years, uh, this latency decreases. So the auditory brainstem waves become faster in both groups, but they become much faster in the control uh, uh, children and they lag behind in the autistic uh, population. And if we do a look at the meta study here of green would be the development of the auditory brainstem waves in uh, typically developing kids. And then um, the ones in, in autistic kids, we see that the younger the kids are, the more um, the development of the auditory brainstem, the, the, the lack, the, the, the delay of the auditory brainstem waves uh, is bigger and it starts to normalize. And by the time they are 18, so this is an 18 and this is nine years of age, it's very small, but you can see that they eventually catch up and they, they seem to normalize in the adult. So auditory brainstem waves are lower and slower. And here I only show the slower in kids with autism. And we can say this, show the same in our catnap rats. This is also done by Kayla Scott. Um, so if we look at the auditory brainstem waves in the rats at different uh, stages of development, this is very young ones, these are adolescents and then young adults. And we look at the peaks of these waves then, um, and uh, the red is always catnap and the blue is always control. We can see that, um, especially in the young ones, that the delays are uh, um, uh, larger here in the, in the catnap. Um, and as they age, these are the different peaks here. And as they age, if, if, as they go from P28 to P70, the red and the blue ones, so the catnap and the wild type rats, they become the same. So the catnaps have this lower and slower. So the lower, I don't show that, but we also showed that they are lower, have slower uh, auditory brainstem waves in as young ones, but it normalizes in the adult. And this is just for different interpeak latencies and it shows basically the same. So we actually recapitulate nicely 
um, the, 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 the symptoms that we see in kids with autism. Another thing we look at is the startle response. And so what has always been reported and also shown in, uh, in scientific studies is that kids with autism startle much higher than um, typically developing kids. They have a higher latency, of course, so they startle uh, later, but they also startle much higher. And this is uh, specifically true in relatively low startle stimulation. So it has to be above threshold to elicit a startle response. But once it elicits its ones, so that we see, if you see this input function, there's a left shift. So the, the, the kids with autism startle um, to, especially to these intermediate startle sounds, much higher than typically developing kids. And we started to look at this um, in kids uh, with autism in collaboration with Rob Nicholson. And it is uh, Renee Phillips that um, did these uh, startle measurements in kids with autism. If we look what this looks like in the rat, we have male and female rats here. We did not measure any female kids because we just couldn't find any, um, which is an entire other discussion. But um, we see uh, in the males, especially in the males, but also to some extent in the females, this left shift of the IO function of the startle response uh, magnitude. So specifically in these intermediate values here, and especially here, very uh, uh, nice uh, nice to see that these um, uh, rats that are catnap knockouts startle much higher at lower startle stimulation than wild type animals. Again, recapitulating what we see in children with autism, they have a left shift of the uh, startle IO function, a greater startle reactivity, especially at lower intensities. And what we also see is that we, if we repeatedly startle them with the same amount of startle um, um, stimulus, with the same startle stimulus, that um, kids with autism tend to sensitize and maybe habituate afterwards, whereas normal kids, normal kids, is, sorry, typically developing kids um, do not show the sensitization and in other cases actually sometimes habituate. Don't uh, worry about the different groups here, but these are the uh, autistic children. And again, we see the same thing in the rats. So if we started them repeatedly, the catnap uh, knockout rats do sensitize rather than habituate, whereas the wild type uh, animals habituate. And that, which is always something, by the way, that goes away as they um, grow adults. But just to remind you, going back one slide, what does not go away in adulthood is that higher startle response. So the higher startle response cannot be caused only by a lack of habituation because um, in adulthood, habituation seems to be intact. It is, um, whereas they still startle to a higher extent. And the last thing I want to show is prepulse inhibition. So if we look at prepulse inhibition, again, this is uh, probing for this um, loop here um, in, in through the midbrain, uh, we see a disruption in prepulse inhibition in our rats that has been reported in some populations uh, of autism, but not in all. So the human prepulse inhibition data is relatively inconsistent. There are reports that there's a disruption in prepulse inhibition, but there are also reports that there's no change or there is an increase in prepulse inhibition. And of course, in these kids with autism that have been tested, we don't know the cause, the underlying cause in most cases of their autism. So to sum this up, so we see a delayed maturation of auditory processing in the brainstem um, in kids with autism, as well as in our rats. We see a higher startle, especially in the adults. And keep in mind, we see a lower uh, uh, brainstem wave. So it seems not that you know, the brainstem is more sensitive to sound. It actually seems to be the opposite because the auditory brainstem response is lower. So the uh, so sound processing of brainstem is not more sensitive, but we see a higher startle. And so there is um, and one of our hypotheses is because there is a, a actually a lower neural processing of sound in the brainstem that at other, some somewhere along the pathway, there's a compensation that tunes up the gain 
and thereby we have a higher reactivity to sound, but not a higher sensitivity. And the same might actually uh, take place at the synapses to the cortex as well, because um, as we'll, I will show in a bit as well, is that we also have a higher activity in the cortex that persists in adulthood. So maybe the brainstem is actually hyposensitive that leads to a compensation mechanism in the brain that then makes the cortex and the perception hypersensitive in compensation for that lower brainstem response early in development. And that would then be exacerbated as the brainstem matures. That's uh, one of our working hypotheses at the moment. And we will be able to test this in the animal, of course. We also can show that the impairments of habituation and of prepulse inhibition, and that this again is parallel in humans and animals. And this habituation and prepulse inhibition is also a measure of sensory filtering. So that is not only the reactions to sound, but it's also how sound is actually filtered on its way to the brain. And I want to just take a, a short break here and or short um, switch gears here and talk just for a couple of minutes about sensory filtering and what that it, what it means if sensory filtering is impaired. Because what I'm, uh, as I mentioned, I have been studying these mechani mechanisms of sensory filtering for the last 20 years. So for me, I find that very interesting um, that there are sensory filtering impairments in these brains, in these autistic brains. So the idea of sensory filtering um, is that all the input into our brain, any signal that goes into the brain is a sensory signal. So it comes from our senses, whether these are five, six or seven, that remains to be determined. And from, of course, internal receptors of our body. But this sensor information we never become aware of. What we become aware of are the sensory information coming from our senses. And the brain has to process all this information and has to store it and compare it and then come up with the output of the brain. And the output of the brain is behavior. So we cannot shut off any of our senses. So they constantly convey a huge amount of information to the brain. So for the brain, it is very, it's quite a task to sort out what is important and what can I ignore. And in order to sort it out, there are different levels where all this sensory information is reduced, it's filtered. One at one end of the spectrum, it's our sensory receptors that are in our sensory organs. They adapt to constant stimulation. So our touch receptors, for instance, they adapt to constant stimulation. Um, so some of the information is reduced at the level of the level of the receptor. At the very other end of sensory processing pathways, it's our attention. We can decide to focus on something and ignore the rest thereby suppressing some, uh, some part of the sensory information reaching our brain. But there are also other mechanisms in between, and these are pre-attentive mechanisms. So mechanisms we cannot consciously influence and they are effortless. They are built in mechanisms in our brain that filter out sensory information. These are neuronal mechanisms. And these are the mechanisms my lab studies. So if these sensory filtering mechanisms are disrupted, what does, it, what does it feel like for a person with disrupted sensory filtering? Well, this is very difficult to demonstrate to you because your sensory filters are there and they are working fine. The closest I can get to demonstrating what this might uh, feel or uh, look like is I like to show this picture by Peter Pruyl, uh, the elder, which uh, was a Dutch uh, painter. And uh, he painted that picture, I think, in 1530 something. So in, in the 16th century, it's called the fall of the rebel angel. And when I ask you now, what did this picture actually show? What is, does that painting show? It's very hard to describe. Why is it hard? Because it's very cluttered. And so this is, I think, what, um, what uh, people with disrupted sensory filtering are struggling with. Their 
brain is bombarded by so much sensory information, it's hard to make sense. It's hard to focus on something because everything else comes unfiltered and everything uh, tends to be cluttered. So again, I study these inbuilt sensory filtering mechanisms and uh, we just uh, uh, established that sensory filtering is impaired in individuals with autism. And two uh, mechanisms of sensory filtering is habituation and prepulse inhibition. So habituation filters out uh, information that is repetitive. Um, and habituation of startle is one way to measure um, this sensory filter. And another, way, uh, another mechanism is prepulse inhibition, where we think the processing of the prepulse inhibits other incoming sensory stimuli so that we can focus on the prepulse. But it's a pre-attentive uh, built-in mechanism. And my lab also studies prepulse uh, inhibition mechanisms and circuitry, but I'm not talking about that. And I'm, I'm not showing you much data. Again, I, I, I'll probably wrap up in the next five minutes. I just want to show you very little snippets um, of our uh, work here. So again, we look at cellular mechanisms of startle itself, habituation and prepulse inhibition. We have done that for 10 years. And if we look at the startle pathway, again, a very nice and short pathway, the spiral ganglion cells that connect the hair cells with the cochlear nucleus, and then these giant neurons in the uh, reticular formation that directly innovate no motor neurons that make us startle. The same pathway in the rat as in the humans. And um, in terms of habituation, we know that it is this synapse here where habituation of startle uh, happens. So this synapse undergoes synaptic depression and that leads to habituation of the startle response. And that seems not to work well in, um, in, um, uh, brain, in autistic brains in our catnap rats, for instance. So what we can do now in the animal, which we can't do in human patients is we can take the brain out, cut the slice, and then record really from a single PNC giant neuron, the startle neuron in the brainstem, and we can stimulate. Um, so this is the part of the startle pathway that we have in the brain slice here of a red brain. We can stimulate um, the afferent pathway, so the auditory pathway. There's, by the way, this is the pathway for a tactile startle response, while we record the response here in the uh, in these giant neurons. So we can really look what happens at the synapses and how are these synapses different uh, in catnap animals. And so we know, and this is work of 17 years, to be honest, that if we repeatedly stimulate these neurons the way they fire. Uh, action potentials when we display a startle sound, that these synapses undergo what we call a synaptic depression. So the, the re uh, response in the PNC giant neurons to activation of uh, this neuron here decreases uh, in an exponential, uh, negative exponential fashion. And that this decrease uh, depends on potassium channels. And again, remember the catnap gene is important for locating potassium channels at um, the synapse. And we see that uh, in catnap animals, they don't habituate. Um, so now, of course, we know that habituation depends on synaptic depression on these uh, big potassium channels here in the synapse. This is work done by a former postdoc. Uh, another postdoc now looks so are these potassium channels um, not directed correctly in the synapses in catnap knockout uh, rats? And does that maybe lead to the lack of habituation? This would be neat because then we can maybe pharmaceutically target these BK channels and see whether we can improve habituation in the rats and ultimately maybe in uh, humans. But these are ongoing studies, so I, I can't actually give you the answer to that question yet. I just want to show you another example. So we also have, I have a student, um, Rash Kamal, um, who can, who records from single neurons in the cortex, in the auditory cortex of these catnap rats and looks at synaptic responses. Uh, to, and th in this case, these are spontaneous synaptic responses. And she can see that these responses be, um, are in, in very young animals are, you know, between one, um, every, well, between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 per second. 
Um, so every 10 seconds or so, she gets a spontaneous synaptic response in an auditory neurons in the cortex. As the animal uh, matures, the number of these spontaneous events increase to 0.3. And then at this age, actually, the ear opens in the rat and there's uh, auditory input. And that means that in wild type animals, um, the, the frequency of these uh, spontaneous events actually stay around uh, 0.3. However, in catnip animals, it further increases. So there are more spontaneous synaptic events in the auditory cortex in, um, in catnip knockout rats here than in wild type. So that means that um, there's either enhanced connectivity, so there are more synapses maybe in the auditory cortex of a catnip rat, or the synapses that are there are more active so that there is a hyper excitability in the catnap rat. And of course, Rash Kamal can do other recordings in the cortex where she can actually see that. We also do recordings in the alive animal in sinking an electrode into the brain of the alive catnap rat. And then we can play a sound and see how that does the auditory cortex respond to sound. And what we find, and this is again um, work by Kayla, um, is that the auditory cortex in catnap rats responds slower than in wild types, but longer lasting and stronger. So there's more action potential. So again, we have this hyper excitability in the auditory cortex in adult catnap rats um, that could be caused by this compensatory synaptic gain I talked about earlier. Um, so we have Hyperexcitability that would explain, for instance, explain for instance, why kids with autism um, are more sensitive to sounds, um, or um, or people with autism are more sensitive to sounds, apart from also not habituating to them. And so the last, and this is my last slide, I want to show is that goes towards. Um, um, th therapeutic uh, approaches so. What I show you, want to show you with these little data snippets that's, uh, that are really only like fractions of the whole data sets that we have. But uh, I, I hope I could convince you that the rats and um, the, the kids show, in, in terms of behavioral phenotypes show very similar behavioral phenotypes that the ABR auditory brainstem response is very similar. Uh, but then in the rat, we can really go more invasively into the brain and see what are the causes, what ion channels, what, what is the, 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 the cause for hyper, are the neurons hyper excitable, excitable? Why are they hyper excitable? But we can also then use the animal to test how can we, can we reverse that? Can we no, normalize these auditory responses? And one um, test trial, and again, it's the last slide I'm going to show is we, we tried our buclofen. Our buclofen is a GABA B agonist. Um, so it, it increases inhibition in uh, the brain. And in autism, there has always been um, this finding that there is not enough inhibition, not enough GABA, and too much excitement, too much glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. So that this equilibrium between inhibition and excitation is a little bit um, imbalanced. And so the idea is if we give our buclofen increased GABAergic inhibition that we could then um, uh, reverse this imbalance. And so there was a huge trial on our buclofen, a multi-site clinical trial in the States um, that utterly failed. And it utterly failed for two reasons. The first reason was that um, there were websites in the internet that told parents how to respond to questionnaires in order to make their kids eligible for the clinical trial. So a lot of parents that were kind of desperate um, to get their kids into clinical trials kind of rigged the system um, and made uh, partly false um, uh, uh, reports or uh, answers and questionnaires in order to enroll their kids in uh, the clinical trial. And then um, uh, during the clinical trial, the measurements heavily relied, again, on parent, parent questionnaires, on the sensory uh, short sensory profile questionnaire and things like that. Um, 
and other uh, questionnaires that report on the behavior of the children, um, which led to the fact that there was a placebo effect of more than 50% efficiency. So any drug efficiency was, was small compared to this huge placebo effect. And um, that placebo effect is probably explainable when um, a, a clinical trial heavily relies on parents' reports where the parents might be, you know, um, there might be a huge stress relief in the parents when they, uh, when their kid made it into um, the clinical trial, which might actually impact their responses in the questionnaires. It also might, uh, the, the more relaxed, less stressed parents might actually impact the behavior of the, of the child and so on and so forth. So long story short, the trial failed. Novartis, who uh, um, produced the drug, uh, stopped, wanted to stop the production of the drug. But the Simons Foundation for Autism Research, SFARI, um, uh, purchased a huge quantity of that drug and is giving it away to whoever wants it for clinical trials or animal research in order to re-evaluate um, um, arbaclofen as a therapeutic. And so we got some arbaclofen from uh, this Simons Foundation for Autism Research, and we did a, a short pilot to just see what does arbaclofen do. And here I show you, uh, again, the catnap rat. So it's a, it's a different data set now. It's not Kayla's data set. This is actually data set by uh, another postdoc in my lab, um, where um, the catnap knockout rats have, again, this left shift of the IO function of the starter. So the louder the starter sound, the more they startle, and it saturates at around 110 decibels. But the catnap knockouts have this left shift. They are more sensitive, especially in this intermediate startle sounds. And um, as when we give them our baclofen, we actually can totally reverse this IO function. This is actually really early data. We have uh, more animals tested now. And these um, two curves actually perfectly align when uh, we give a relatively low dose of our baclofen to the catnap uh, knockout animals, where it does um, it, it affects both animals a little bit by shifting their curve to the right or dampen their startle response, but um, it normalizes the response of the catnap knockout animal. So this is, uh, and again, this is uh, um, work by Dorit Murle, a postdoc in my lab. So this is a very promising um, um, result, and we have a little more results in terms of pre-pulse inhibition and some uh, other measurements as well. So our baclofen reverses the, at least the increased startle responses in catnap animals and rats. And with this, I want to uh, wrap up. So what I have shown you is that there are changes in auditory processing um, in our catnap rats that mirror the changes in uh, autism. That these sensory processing disruptions in autism offer a unique opportunity for translational studies because we can then leverage the rat model to really look at mechaniz mechanisms on the cellular level, on synaptic level, on the molecular level, and then um, see what is going on and how can we reverse that. Uh, and we can also test um, uh, therapeutics then in the animal, at least of this in this group of symptoms. Um, but I, I think I also have shown you the uh, once the importance, but also the difficulty of these um, genetic and envi environmental and environmental animal models to model a complex disorder like uh, autism. And with this, I want to finish. I want to briefly acknowledge the collaborators on this project, which is Dr. Brian Allman, an anatomy cell biology um, with whom he's an expert in in vivo electrophysiology, and he's a co-supervisor of many of the trainees on this project. Dr. Ryan Stevenson and the psychology department who studies sensory processing in autism or has been studying it for a long time, uh, using um, like studying it in kids with autism. Dr. Janice Cardi and the National Center for Audiology with, uh, with whom we want to do these ABR measurements in the same kids where we do the starter measurements. And then Rob Nicholson, of course, um, who uh, sends us a never ending um, um, uh, number of kids with autism from his practice. Without him, we could not even uh, do any of these studies in humans. 
And I have two other um, collaborators on this project, which is Sonia Vernes in Nijmegen, who actually has stem cells from individuals with autism that we grow now to little organoids, brain organoids, and we do electrophysiology in human catnap cells and compare it to rat catnap cells, catnap knockout cells. And then Steve Renault, who actually, with whom we look at placenta and the prenatal development of, of the kids or of rat pups uh, and how that actually impacts, how um, maternal immune activation actually impacts the brains during development. And with this, I want to end. Thank you. Suzanne, thank you. That was wonderful. And I, I want to talk about the Arbaclofen or ask you a couple of questions. But I uh, just remind people that um, so Sarah O'Flanagan will send everybody a link uh, tomorrow uh, if to complete evaluations and, and as well for people to get continuing education credits. The only proviso on that is that people have to have used their own name and not a short form or things uh, in signing it. Otherwise, there's no way for Sarah to know. Um, uh, who people uh, are. So it's five o'clock, but we have time for questions as long as people can stay. So I was going to say, Suzanne, we actually, I didn't realize that you had done work with our baclofen because I'm actually involved in another clinical trial of our baclofen uh, in, uh, in, in children and adolescents with autism. And I think the other problem, uh, the trial that you mentioned, because it was negative, but what it also happened was that oftentimes in clinical trials, whoever fills out a rating scale, it often depends upon which parent is available that day. And so you're going to get inconsistency from parent to parent. And so when they, they went back into the post hoc analysis and found that if they could, uh, if they only included the participants who had the same parent fill out the rating scales each time, there was actually a statistically significant improvement in overall day to day functioning. Oh, uh, and so know. yeah, so so actually we are redoing the study essentially, but insisting that it's the same parent each time who completes the rating scale to see that. I don't think we are actually doing the um, short sensory profile, and I don't know why. But we actually, I think we are planning on doing EEG stuff using uh, Ryan's uh, machine. Uh, and so hopefully we'll be, I'm not exactly sure what the protocol is, but hopefully looking at those sensory things uh, to see what, uh, what happens with that. And certainly I've seen a few kids, I can't comment upon the sensory aspect, but have shown improvement with it. So it's really interesting. One, so is one Ryan doing, uh, so Ryan is doing uh, measurements with these kids in, that, in this study? No, I mean, we're gonna use his machine. Oh, okay. Because it would be interesting to do maybe acoustic startle response as well on these kids. Well, I mean, right now we're not doing very much for obvious reasons, but the, I mean, I think when we get started up, I would like to talk about that. Do you know, uh, do you know Jason Lurch in Toronto? Uh, I, I know him, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know him well personally. So I know him, I, I'm not sure if he knows me. That's no, what it but, is. But it's, but it's interesting because he, he was telling me that they had done some stuff with, um, with and I don't know if it was rats or mice with, with our back of it, but he might have used the term bloodbath at one point in time to describe what happened amongst the uh, the animals, uh, and so I'm not sure if you had seen anything like that. So our baclofen, so we had injected systemically, uh, indeed, because we want to uh, mimic the situation and like we want to have it systemically. Uh, it's always an easy way out to just uh, apply it locally to the auditory brainstem or something like that. So we gave it systemically. Um, we did it both acute. So what I showed here was acute, but we also did a chronic study where we gave it for, uh, for more than two weeks. Um, in the acute study, you have to very be, be very cautious with the dosing. Um, if you dose it too high, they just don't move anymore. They are just flat out. I mean, they are very slow. So we, um, that's why we, um, I actually showed the, the very low dose because this is the dose where we don't have motor effects. And we also wait an hour after administration. So the, um, right after the administration, like uh, the first 10 minutes, they are, uh, they're very slow, but um, we, they, they recover. And then after an hour that uh, it actually looks pretty good. And in a chronic study, this is not a problem at all. Again, it has to be thoroughly dosed, but Jason Lurch also works with mice, right? So there is a difference. Right. Yeah, and, mice mice. And, and I think actually, because we've seen with a few people taking it with each dose increase, there's a slight increase in agitation. And so I think in mice, there was, uh, as in, it might have been some open warfare among certain mice, my understanding, uh, really? that apparently some of them became quite aggressive. I don't know all the ins and outs, but, but something happened there. So yeah, we don't see we, that in rats. Well, and, and not in humans either, so which is a good thing, probably. So, um, but I'd love to talk to you more about that sometime and about the, the sisters with the catnap mutation. So uh, Jennifer McLean, who's a pediatrician here at, uh, at CPRI and at uh, Thames Valley Children's Center, 
I had a question about uh, is our, uh, the latencies that you see in the auditory brainstem um, responses, uh, are they specific to autism or are they seen across different neurodevelopmental problems? Um, so I'm not uh, exactly the right person to ask this. I would probably, uh, so Janice Carty or Sangam or uh, someone from NCA would be better suited to ask that, uh, to answer that. My, um, my guess would be it is not, so it's not exclusively kids with autism. I would assume that there are um, other neurodevelopmental disorders that show a delayed um, uh, ABR response spe specifically, you know, the, I know that Janice is looking at a specific language impairment where um, similar uh, things I think are seen. So it's by sure not a, uh, like a diagnostic criterion for, uh, for ASD. Um, plus it might not it might not, or it might be to a different extent in, in kids with ASD. Again, I think uh, autism is not one disease, right? It's a spectrum and it has huge overlap with other disorders. So uh, I would uh, assume it's not exclusive to ASD. I'm sure there are other, not, uh, not every, but there are other neurodevelopmental disorders where we see this slowed ABR development. What I'd wondered too, in the people with the catnap mutations, if they also have significant cognitive impairments, are the differences that you see, are they due to autism or to the intellectual disability? That is difficult to say. So um, our rats, by the way, are cognitively not much impaired. So we can do the rate discrimination task. They can learn these simple tasks. These tasks are simple, of course, uh, compared to humans. Um, and the humans do have uh, cognitive impairments. Um, but they also have pretty severe seizures uh, from a certain age on, which, uh, so it's always difficult to, to say to what extent is the cognitive impairment uh, a result of the seizures. We, we By the way, our rats get seizures um, at the age of two or three months. They start to get severe seizures as well. So at, you know, just uh, after puberty, which again parallels humans uh, pretty well, but we have to euthanize them and they start to get these heavy seizures. So we, um, they, they, I'm sure they would uh, develop cognitive impairment as well um, if we would keep them. Because yeah, because the two sisters that I see, they uh, one of them has epilepsy, the other actually doesn't, I don't think. Uh, and the interesting, and I don't know how it happened, but I think they both inherited because they both have the same mutation, so it's got to be inherited. And I'm pretty sure it's from the mom, and she actually has no symptoms at all. Yeah. But is that what you would expect? Yeah, I'm not sure if cognitive impairment is needs to be but, 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 but she has no symptoms of autism the mom has no symptoms of autism or intellectual disability and she's the carrier of the mutation so does, uh, has that been confirmed that she's a carrier of the mutation well I, i'm pretty sure i'd have to double check but the two sisters both have the same mutation so somebody yeah. i mean presumably the likelihood is carrier. infinitely small so in our case uh, the heterozygous um, um mutation uh, the heterozygous rats have very mild if any uh Phenotype, it is really the full knockout um, that shows uh, the, okay. the symptoms. And that might be the same in humans that it's recessive, right? That it has to, or that it has to be, no, it, it doesn't, it's not the same in humans. I think a uh, heterozygous knockout is sufficient in humans. No, it's not. It can't be if the mother doesn't have it. But honestly, I would have to see the full profile whether, you know, that. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not sure. One. I'm not saying the mom has no problems in it, and I'd wonder about the penetrance and things like that uh, as well. But it's something that I was curious to me about the fact the mom, I'm pretty sure, is the carrier of it and has no problems. So Dr. Ogilvy, who's a developmental pediatrician at Thames Valley Children's Center and, and over at LHSC, was asking about uh, you know so the exaggerated uh, response. So when you get the slowed ABRs, but also the exaggerated responses uh, and the start responses, uh, and you see them in a lab uh, in mice things, but in humans. Do those and people with autism, do they correlate with what people report on the sensory um, processing measure? So there's the short sensory profile and things? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And Renee did this uh, in the kids with autism. She did the sensory, uh, short sensory profile questionnaire and measured the startle response. And there was actually not a very high correlation. There was a very high correlation with the ADHD um, uh, profile. Mm. Um, so with a different type of questionnaire um, and not so much with a sensory profile, which um, shows that um, I think the sensory, 
even if she took out specific questions in the sensory profile that would be more relevant for acoustic startle response. Uh, so interestingly, it did not uh, correlate strongly, which um, is interesting, exactly. Uh, um, and there are different ways how you could explain that. It could mean that the sensory profile is not, uh, not a very good measure or not a very subjective measure, um, but it also measures um, other things than, again, the startle response is a implicit reactive reaction, right? It is, has nothing to do with um, conscious perception, um, with higher cortical behavior. So yeah, so there are different ways to interpret that. But yeah, I found that uh, also very interesting that there was only this, that, that there was a, a very weak correlation between the parent questionnaire and the uh, objective measure of startle responses. I wonder with a lot of parent questionnaires, I mean, they're going to be somewhat subjective to the parent. And I, I would wonder, and, and we have a few occupational therapists here who can maybe educate me, but, but I would wonder even like parent-parent reliability, I wonder how high it is on some of those measures. I mean, so either, um, so Allison or Lisa, uh, and I don't necessarily mean to pick on you guys if you don't want to answer, that's fine. But I mean, what do you, what do you guys think about the uh, short sensory profile as a measure? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I guess to answer that, you can either put up your hand or you can ignore me, I suppose. Oh, and sorry, there's one hand that is raised, but I cannot see. Uh, ah, Lisa Hoyland, I will allow you to talk, Lisa. And if you could unmute yourself. There you go. Can you hear me? Can you hear yep. me? Yep. yep. Yeah, so um, I, my understanding of the short sensory profile, it's not something that... Um, that I typically use, it is more of a screener. So there are more in depth. Uh, there is a, a longer sensory profile form, which, which would have more questions in each of the sensory systems. And there's also something called the sensory processing measure. And that is a measure that we typically uh, use at CPRI. What, what is, what's the difference? It's longer um, than the screener for sure, um, but it's not as long as the sensory profile. So there's, there's a, a number of different types of measures out there. Uh, that are scorable, um, and that would have questions within each of the sensory systems. Um, the one that we use with the sensory processing measure does have quite a few uh, questions within the auditory uh, section that asks about response to uh, general like household noises, um, overreactions to those, uh, as well as overreactions to um, uh, loud sounds and then uh, just in, in general and then overreactions to uh, things like brassy sounds like instruments and that kind of thing. Is, is it available? Is it on the first floor uh, test room there? Yes. Not, th not that I want to go and look for it, but just if I did. But uh, and, and what I was saying earlier about the parent parent reliability, do you know anything? Have you ever seen anything about that? Uh, I have not. Uh, I don't know if there's anything in the research looking at that, but but yeah, I, I will sometimes do those measures with both parents if the if the parents are separated or divorced and, a, and the child is living with both of them uh, part time. And there's often very different responses for sure. Mm -hmm. That's what, thank you, Lisa. That's really appreciated. I mean, so, but along those lines, we, uh, Suzanne, I mean, you talked about pharmacological uh, possible approaches. I mean, are there other non-pharmacological interventions that you think or that you see as potentially being a benefit? Yes, so um, again, uh, what, what, what we can see in the rat is that it's actually a hyperreactivity, not a hypersensitivity maybe. And there are these compensatory mechanisms uh, uh, that seems to exacerbate the situation then after the brainstem uh, matures. And uh, what we can, what, what we want to do uh, at one point in the rat is, to do some form of exposure therapy, you know, or um, also multi, I mean, we are not only looking at auditory system, we also, especially with Ryan, look at multisensory integration, which is also different in autism and um, do an exposure therapy uh, with multisensory uh, stimuli and see whether this actually changes or increases the auditory brainstem response that then might maybe, uh, uh, avoid this synaptic gain changes that we hypothesize that take place. And at the moment we focus on, on, on looking at this uh, synaptic gain and how does it occur? Does it occur and how does it occur? 
But the next step, that is uh, AIM-3 in my CHR grant that we just got last year, <laughs> um, is to then actually uh, look at um, not only uh, pharmacological, but behavioral or, or sensory uh, interventions uh, early on and see whether we can influence that, which would be nice because that would mean, you know, that um, something like behavioral or exposure interventions might actually impact uh, the development, which they do for sure, right? So, but in rats, a lot of studies focus on, on pharmaceutical um, uh, therapeutics, which I think um, is, is always one way, but it would be nice to actually look at other forms as well. Well, especially if we could intervene in kids at a very young age or something like that, uh, and yeah. say, not only help them out, but, but change the course of, uh, of development for them. Exactly. Okay. I don't want to necessarily give drugs to a six month old kid. <laughs> I, I would have some issues with that potentially, I think, depending upon the case, but I would agree. Uh, if I, are there any other questions people would like to ask uh, Dr. Schmidt? Uh, yes, uh, Lisa, uh, Ms. Hoyland, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, so just a comment about that that last piece with um, with the multi-sensory uh, sort of approach to intervention. You know, that that typically is sort of what uh, occupational therapists using a sensory integrative approach are, are attempting to do, um, which is providing, you know, in a sensory rich environment for the child mm -hmm. uh, where they're able to get, um, you know, movement input, uh, proprioceptive input, tactile input, um, that, you know, there's lots of um, research looking at how that is impacting the tactile system mm -hmm. and children's responses to uh, tactile input over time and some of that decrease in reactivity or sensitivity in that system. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there's only one person that actually does that, I, to my knowledge, in, in rats or mice, where they actually do all these multisensory, where they have, you know, little platforms that tip over when the animal goes on and that they it's connected with the sound as well. And so there's, they, they try to do that in rats as well. And this is something we would like to adopt at one point and then look at how that, um, now that we have the catnap rat as a good model, how this actually impacts the sensory information. It's very interesting, I think, because the, um, the vestibular system is very often impacted with children with autism as well. So seeing things like uh, low muscle tone and, um, limited extension of their body against gravity. Uh, so some of those things that are pretty consistent and, that, and then also that those uh, children with autism are typically drawn to movement activities. So almost like they have a very um, high threshold for movement input. Uh, so just very interesting uh, in terms of some consistencies with different sensory systems and um, observations in children with autism. Yeah, it's always good to talk to people that are, you know, actually working with kids with autism because uh, it gives us ideas what to look at other than, of course, we are focused on auditory processing, but to, to uh, you know, other things that uh, can be observed in, in kids with autism that might not be classically modeled in the animal, but which we actually could model in the animal, uh, what we, where we could look at uh, things in the animal. So, yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and also... Sorry. Go ahead, Lisa. No, go ahead. Also the physical um, sort of proximity of the vestibular receptors to the auditory uh, yeah. system too. So very interesting. But I, th and I think Suzanne, I think there was some work in uh, fragile X models, whether or not where if they had like an enriched environment from a young age that they seem to show significant improvement, which is another sort of uh, non-pharmacological intervention. Uh, and so I think those kind of things are possible. But it is, uh, again, it's mouse. The problem is autism has been cured, and Alzheimer, by the way, has been cured in a mouse many, many times um, and, and uh, does not translate well to the human. And in terms of um, the brain and, and um, especially cognitive behavior and things like that, the, um, the mouse is very far away from the human and the rat is uh, halfway. So a rat is not a big mouse. It's, uh, it's a different animal that is actually... I, I have to make the point, it is a better model for these kind of uh, disorders. So um, I'm sure that these exposure the uh, uh, therapies, uh, these exposure things have an impact, um, um, but it might be not as simplistic as it as in some of these mouse studies where, you know, you throw them in an enriched environment, everything is fine. Um, yeah, it's, 
There's also a BK channel blocker has been shown to cure fragile X in a mouse. Um, but I, that, that's a drug that um, we try to give systemically to a rat and we do not want to repeat <laughs> for now until there's a, a different drug because that was our bloodbath. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think there have actually been several uh, MGLUR antagonists, I think, which have been tried in humans in fragile X and have been, I, I don't know how successful they were, but they weren't enough to make them commercially viable. And I think the two or three that have been tried, the trials were not successful. The companies sort of lost interest in them. But but it, I think at least it shows that people are trying to make those translational uh -huh. uh, leaps anyway, which which I think is a great part of, of the work you do. So, uh, you know, thank you again, Suzanne. This was fantastic and an, and an excellent talk to begin the year. You have set a very high bar for every other speaker uh, um, this year. So our next uh, session is in February. I don't know the date off the top of my head. It's the second February, uh, second Wednesday of February, and Joan Gardner will be talking presumably about speech and language related issues. We will see everybody then. And thank you again, Suzanne. This was wonderful. Yeah, it was nice uh, seeing you. <laughs> Absolutely. I will talk to you later on. Yep. Thank you. Take everyone. care. Bye-bye, everybody.